Hey guys, I hope everybody is this all here. Um, you might hear the AC on the background because it's really hotter than hell out here right now. It's almost a hundred in Southern California. It's crazy. So I hope you guys enjoy this week's episode Q&A with Chris McKinnell and uh, so I'll just quit. Hey guys, I hope you guys enjoy this week's episode Q&A with Chris and uh, that's all I would like to have my guests introduce themselves and what they do and we'll start from there. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm sorry, you're, you're cutting in and out. I got Chris McKinnell here. His no, voice, I can hear you now. His voice didn't wait. Thank you so much for your time. And, um, and as, as always, I'll let the viewers uh, submit their questions. And or if you like to share anything, that'll be great. Well, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has uh, about paranormal, about my grandparents, about my own work. The Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research. I'm here to um, try to educate and help people. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm also a big fan of the Warrens. And I'm uh, their only grandson. Uh, they also have a granddaughter. She's not involved in work. Um, they have a total of four great grandchildren and one great great grandchild. Oh, wow. Okay, so it's a nice family. That's awesome. And then, like Michelle said, they're like the pioneers of this paranormal. You know, and that's. Uh, is they're not. Um, I think they did a lot to make it mainstream, uh -huh. uh, which is you know absolutely true. But there were people before my grandparents going back before Sir Arthur Conan. Um, oh, yeah. Well, before him, there yeah. were people looking at the paranormal. Um, that's it's true. something that's fascinated people for. Always questioning what is reality. How do we understand it? I think that's what science, religion, philosophy, art, music, all of that is a different way of uh, attempting to understand the mind of God and his creation. Right. I really appreciate the words. <coughs> Sorry, there's always my voice. <laughs> Sorry. It's not a problem. <clears throat> so, um, I was wondering what got you interested in the paranormal in the first place. Well, honestly, it is the family business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with it, um, and I, I was afraid of the dark until I was 16. Uh, early in my childhood, I started trying to learn from different religions. I studied with Jehovah's Witnesses, with the Mormons. Uh, Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, uh, I went to Israel to study. Um, I was always looking for a better understanding of what is God and why are we here. And when your grandparents are plastered all over the media all the time for doing this kind of thing, it made me question a lot, often. Uh, especially in the early years. Um, you know, they started doing this while well, my grandfather was a child living in a haunted house, but they formed the Normal Society for Psychic Research in 1952. So they, they started almost 70 years And uh, in the 70s, they started to become well known uh, because of some big cases that took place and uh, the news caught on to it and it went a little insane to be honest. Uh, it's one of the reasons why the Warren Legacy Foundation doesn't uh, advertise our cases. We don't give out personal details about our clients because, you know, we, we learned that publicity can be very damaging to a family. 
And we don't want to perpetuate that. We don't want to make it even worse. We want to make things better. But for me personally, um, I would say I also studied quantum physics and psychology. And it's, it's all been about trying to understand what is reality? How do we shape it? Um, what are these entities that we deal with? And why do they do what they do? Because it is different all over the world. You know, I've, I've been lucky enough to live in over a dozen countries on five continents. And the paranormal presents itself differently uh, wherever you are in the world. Ghosts are pretty much the same no matter where you go. But the inhuman entities that some people call elementals, demons, angels, they present themselves differently depending on what the cultural beliefs and spiritual beliefs of the region is. That's how they will present themselves. And that fascinates me. Yeah, I stand here. I'm also a medium, and I tend to hear both good and evil spirits, so I know for that they're real. I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, I'm also a spirit medium, and I and I hear both good and evil spirits, and then I have my experiences with them, so I know for a fact they're real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they are definitely real. You know, the thing is, though, <clears throat> people think that these things are ageless and have, have the wisdom of the ages. My, my grandfather was that. Uh -huh. But in my experience, um, and I've done this for about 40 years now, um, I've never seen anything that we call demonic that has done half as much as what human beings do to another human That I think that we are capable of far more evil than anything that we call a demon. Right, and I have this to lead to my next question for a friend of mine. She wants to know if, uh, let's see if I can read my writing. Is it possible that a demonic entity is able to visit our dreams? No, absolutely. Absolutely. I that too. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so can ghosts. Um, it is right. the simplest time, the easiest time, for a uh, spirit to reach us because we're more open. We're closer to the astral plane when we're sleeping. Our resting mind is is much more available to them. Oh, I totally believe that, and they even wake me up too, like at three a.m. <laughs> I apologize again. You're you're cutting in and out. I said they even wake me up too sometimes at three a.m. And is that a specific reason why they do that? Do you know? Well, you say that they're waking you up around 3 o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my grandfather came up with this idea that um, 3 o'clock was the devil's hour, that it was an insult to the Trinity, and that is why the demonic manifests most at 3 to 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the truth is, or at least my understanding of it is, that because we have now invested the idea that three o'clock is the witch or the devil's hour, that has become the time when things manifest most easily. Um, they will always come when you're in your most vulnerable. And from three to five o'clock in the morning, you are at your most vulnerable. That is when you're in your REM state, that's when uh, you're at your most rested, it's when it is darkest. And that's when they're going to get the most um, impact from whatever energy they use to scare you. Remember that these things feed off of our negative energy. Um, in a way, they're like a psychic vampire. Um, and so they would put out a little bit of energy to get back as much energy from them as they possibly can. That way, it, it enables them to get stronger and manifest even more things in our world. I totally agree. <laughs> um, I'll ask a couple more questions from my list here. Sure. Um, has anything ever followed you from an investigation or ever? Do you want to like an exorcism? Oh, yes. Yeah. Many, many, many times. Many times. I've been lucky enough that I've never had any attachments, but I've certainly had things attack me in my home because 
either I had just set up a exorcism or I had just asked for uh, people to start praying for a family or uh, I was arranging to go on a case and they will try to intimidate. Uh, they turned on the um, gas on my stove without turning on the flame so the whole house filled up with gas. That's happened a number of times. Uh, they made it so the car doesn't start on my way to a case. That's happened quite a few times. It's pretty common. Uh, they've stolen my glasses so that I can't see and I can't drive. Uh, they have punched me. They levitated me. They stuck me like it felt like a knife. I uh, felt like I was on fire. Um, yeah. Quite a number of things have happened. Oh wow, that's crazy. Well, it's the price you pay for the work you do, but right. I take right. a lot of precautions, and I never ever show fear. Fear is the, the real enemy of it. it. When you're afraid, you lose your faith, and that's when they're able to get a hold of you and they can hurt you. That's true. And I know this to lead to my next question. Um, how do you know if a person has uh, attachments? Okay. <clears throat> well, we ask them all of questions um, because you know it can be a lot of different things that are not a spiritual attachment. Also, we work with psychics. I can feel if there's a negative energy around me, uh, and anybody who's psychic can tell you. It feels like it's very, very heavy. It's a very heavy feeling pushing down on you. Yeah. Um, it can be a little bit painful too sometimes. Uh, but the kind of things we look for with an attachment, is there any manifestation outside of your personal experience? In other words, has anybody else witnessed things happening around you? Uh, what have you done that may have opened you up to an attachment? Right. Um, are you psychic and are you manifesting something yourself without an entity being there? Because that's what the poltergeist phenomena often is. I mean, sometimes there's an entity involved, but other times it is simply energy that somebody has been to, particularly either an adolescent or a person who's got some anxiety or depression has a great deal of energy and they tap into this other energy and it manifests uh, their subconscious. Oh, I totally believe that. And uh, let's see, do we have any questions yet? No. But I have a few lined up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's see, I'm sure you get asked this a lot. What would be uh, the scariest case you worked on? Um, well, there have been a couple of cases where people have died, and there have been a couple where we that was a real possibility. Uh, I remember one time I was working in Newtown, Connecticut, next to a funeral home. Uh, as a matter of fact, anybody who's ever seen photos of the Warren Lake Warren Museum, a uh, Pope Museum, mm -hmm. there's a very tall statue of a demon, uh, which handmade. Uh, it's about seven feet tall with big horns. And we found that in the woods behind the house uh, that I had been investigating. This was a pregnant woman and her husband. <clears throat> and I was there with one of the men that I worked with at the time. And at night, one night, uh, the family was asleep in the other bedroom. And my partner and I were sleeping in a separate bedroom. And we were woken by this, by the woman screaming at the top of her lungs. And the guy I was with kind of overreacted and uh, just, oh my god, oh my god, and I, I was sitting on the floor to get, out, to get him out of my way. Mm -hmm. I ran into the bedroom, and her husband was levitated above her over the bed. Remember, she's pregnant. Wow. And he's, he's under possession. And I ran and I jumped and I tackled him and I, uh, we ended up on the other side of the bed on the floor. 
and I was screaming by the power of Jesus Christ I commanded him to be born and commanding him to uh, this entity to believe him. And then my uh, colleague came running in the holy water and spinning him with the holy water. And uh, after two or three minutes, he did come out of it. But that's a bad case. There were Satanists involved who were using um, necromancy, uh, which is using the energy of the dead to make things manifest and try to get what they want. And one evening, they tried to follow uh, me and my colleague out when we left the house. And we ended up having to lose them doing a lot of backs and back roads and twists and turns and going at an unreasonable <laughs> rate of speed. Um, and my my colleague never actually went back to the house after that, week, so she worried about it. And I don't blame him. He had a time I didn't. And I was young. And I, uh, at that time, I think I thought I was invincible. Right. Oh, wow. That would have been scary. But, uh, you know, Maurice Theriot, that's a pretty old case. Uh, that one was known as uh, Satan's Harvest. That was in Warren, Massachusetts. And even though we did a successful uh, exorcism with Bishop McKenna, and my grandparents were there for that as well. My grandpa actually had a heart attack during that exorcism. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. And there, yeah, and the man came under possession during the exorcism. He was drooling blood. His eyes took on the split appearance of a snake. His the skin got all scaly, his forehead cracked open. Uh, but Bishop McKenna did a successful uh, exorcism. And then a few years later, unfortunately, uh, because the underlying vulnerabilities were never done, he came out of the possession. And he did exactly what his father did. His father had called him and called for the first time in Maurice's entire life, he said, Maurice, I just want you to know I love you. And then he picked up a rifle, went in, killed Maurice's mother, and killed himself. And Maurice came into possession and picked up his shotgun, blew the arm off his wife, and then killed himself. And recently we had another case we were working on. Uh, the Catholic Church got involved. They agreed the man was under possession, uh, that he really needed an exorcism yeah. battle. He was coming into possession a ridiculous number of times every single day. <clears throat> And unfortunately, the church didn't move fast enough. They took months. And his wife came home, and he was under possession. And he said, excuse my language, but he said, fuck it, I'm going to kill him. And he ran upstairs. He had a noose prepared with a power cord, and he hung himself from the balcony. And uh, he actually, the, the entity inside of him, animated his body uh, maybe 30 minutes I, I can't remember if it was 10 or 13 or 30 minutes after he was dead uh, the, the emergency medical technician was there the police were there they were watching it and the entity made the body sit up and open its eyes they were completely black he said something to the EMT and then he dropped back down dead this is definitely not worked for amateurs. It's not work uh, that you should do if you don't know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing and you're doing this work now, please contact the One Legacy Foundation and let us help mentor you because this is serious. It's like trying to practice medicine without a medical license. Right. I would like to be able to have um, to uh, like have one of you guys mentor me. Just totally. And well, you know, we do have um, a psychic support group, and that's only open to psychics. Uh, we're very careful. It's a completely anonymous group. Uh, obviously, the people in the group know who each other are, but no one else does, and we, we, we are very protective of them. It's a therapeutic and supportive environment where 
people who are either overwhelmed by their abilities or want to learn how to use their abilities better uh, can go and get find us on Facebook. It's the Warren Legacy Foundation Psychic Support Group. And, or you can just contact me on Facebook or you can write to us at Warren Legacy Foundation at gmail.com and we'll be happy to help you. And we don't charge anybody for any help that we give. Um, never had, never will. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, my grandfather did it, and it, it, consider it our mission, you know, uh, our ministry. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you guys took over to do it. Yeah. Can you can you repeat that, please? I'm I'm glad you guys took over because I'm worried I'm such a big fan of the word, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, there are a lot of uh, good people out there who like their work, but you know, if, if you're interested in um, my grandparents, I can tell you the two best books to read okay. would be um, the Demonologist and the Devil in Connecticut if you can find it. Uh, I also like. Um, Satan's Harvest. That was about the Maurice Theriot case, and that was written by two Boston Globe reporters. Those are the, th I think, in my opinion, the three best books uh, that were written about my grandparents with my grandparents' help. Um, the others are okay, um, but the, the authors took a lot of literary license and uh, didn't get a lot of things correct as well. So that's a shame. Thank you, I wrote those down. <laughs> and also, uh, can you explain the difference between ghosts or spirits and or demonic entities? <clears throat> sure, of course. It's very simple, actually. Um, well, at least part of that is very simple. <laughs> a ghost is a human spirit. It's a it's a person, and I don't really understand why people are afraid of other people. Yeah. You know, most ghosts are just people, and they're probably more free to do than you are of them. Most of them are confused, and they don't even accept that they are dead, which is why they're still here. They're stuck here because yeah. they have not accepted their death. Uh, so they've retreated to some place they feel most comfortable in life, or unfortunately, some are stuck in the moment of their death. Now, there's also something known as a residual quantum, and there is no ghost involved with a residual quantum. What that is, is an uh, imprint on the location, a psychic imprint that sensitive people can pick up on and can uh, either hear or smell or even see events that took place in the past. That's why, for instance, uh, when you go to the castle dungeons in Europe. You may hear the clanking of chains and moans and groans. There's no actual ghost there. What there is, is a, an imprint, a recording. And stone picks up those imprints far better than wood or earth would do. Now, a demonic entity, that's a little harder to define because it depends on where you are in the world. A Hindu family is never going to be haunted by a Christian demon. And even in like, for instance, in Germany, there's a famous case where the girl thought that she was possessed by Adolf Hitler, Nero, um, and I think the Elzebub, or Asmodeus, I can't call it off the top of my head. Um, but that kind of cultural evil was what she thought of as evil, and that's why it manifested in that way, because it had the most impact on her, and therefore it made her more vulnerable, it made her throw off more negative energy, and that's what they're looking for. The demons manifest in a way that will give you the most fear. Right. You know, and, and sometimes, in for instance, um, the new movie coming out, Conjuring Bridge, it was about um, the only young uh, David Brossel was a, a young boy, I think he was 10 or 11, 
and his mother and sister were playing with a Ouija board he was in another room and unfortunately he was the one that was the weakest in the family and these things attach to the weakest they are predators and they go for the weakest prey and it manifested to him first as an old man with colon hoods another time and we, we have a picture of this actually um, another time it manifested as a full red skin devil with horns and everything mm -hmm. and that's because for an 11 year old mind that was the most terrifying thing he could imagine and therefore it manifested that way for him well, it must be scary I look forward to that next film. <laughs> but demons are not human. They've never been human. They've never been here. They are, for all intents and purposes, alien. They are a diff from a different dimension. Uh -huh. I believe that. <laughs> Alright. Um, you have a couple more questions here. Yeah, uh... Now leads to the next question. Can spirits or demonic influence our emotions? Absolutely. Yeah, that's known as oppression. Okay. Uh, the, the, the stages of a haunting normally go this way. Mm -hmm. First, there's an infestation. That's when things are external to you. So, um, you know, things will start going missing. You'll hear knocking noises. You'll hear the sound of breaking glass. Uh, and maybe things will start flying around. That kind of stuff is known as an infestation. Then as you become more and more vulnerable, as it breaks down your defenses and makes you more and more afraid, you are then opening yourself up for an attachment, and that's when they can start to oppress you. And oppression is when they start to change how you feel. They start to control how you feel. And you will act out of character. You'll become more violent. You'll become more despondent. And that, again, is to break you down further so they can, in extremely rare circumstances, they can possess you. And that would be the final stage. And that's their final goal there is to destroy the family, destroy you and your faith, and probably kill you. Right, and that's their ultimate goal, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah, I believe that. <laughs> and, let's see. Find another question. Someone lives here. Yeah. Um, let's see. And he just answered about the whole thing. So I'll scratch that out. <laughs> okay. And well, if anybody is listening to this and has any questions, please let us know. Yeah, let's know. We have a few more minutes. What was, okay, here's one. What, what would be the scariest place that you've been to so far? The most serious place? A serious place, yes. Yeah. A scariest place. Uh, well, personally, I've only been in one home that actually scared me, and that was my first case. And it was right out of Hollywood, Poltergeist case. I've spoken about it many times. Um, there were two hulking black shapes that came into the room. Uh, the woman was clawed right in front of us, uh, pop with holy church incense flew out of the kitchen around the corner and straight at my head, just barely missed me. Um, the lights started going on and off, the pounding noises shaking the house, growling, clawing sound inside the walls. All of that happened on my very first case. And I had been afraid of the dark uh, until that night. And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, but after that, I was never afraid of the dark again, and I never was afraid on a case now. Okay. It, was, it was baptism by fire. My grandfather was a World War II veteran, and he joined the Marines at 16, got kicked out, 
when he uh, joined the Navy when he was 17. And I think he just looked at me and he said, this is what this kid needs. He needs to get out there and see what it's really all about. And it worked. Thanks for sharing this. It's kind of like the same theory where your dad throws you in the deep end of the pool to teach you to swim. Right. Any other questions? Uh, Would you say you have any psychic abilities, like this one? I do, yes. Uh, I've always had them. But in college, I scared so many people because, of, and many psychics would, would be able to relate to this. I scared so many people uh, by knowing things that made them comfortable that I suppressed most of my abilities for most of my life. Uh, I still used them or used them to um, tell if there was something negative in them, but that was as far as I would allow myself to go for the longest time. It's only in the last seven or eight years that I've allowed myself to open up more. I've used some leadership abilities on occasion, but it's still not something I feel very comfortable doing. I'm a far more analytical person, a far more scientific person, and I prefer to defer to far better psychics on a case and then get their opinions separate from one another and then also see if it matches what I'm finding on the ground. Oh wow. Thanks for sharing that. By nature I'm a skeptic. Oh, okay. I'm trying to be open. <laughs> And I'm sorry, you, you cut out. What was that? I was trying to keep an open mind about these things. Let's see. Um, so it's being an exorcist, how do you cleanse uh, a household person? How do, you, how do you do an exorcism? Yeah, or if you don't mind sharing. Um, well, it's not an easy thing, and no, I, I kind of do mind sharing because when I work with people, they'll often say, well, how do I do it? How can I do it? And you wouldn't watch an episode of the ER and then go out and try to do surgery. Oh, right. And I don't want to give people a shorthand canned answer and then have them run out and try to do it themselves. Right. Uh, I don't want people to get hurt. So the, my basic message to almost everybody in the world is stay away from the paranormal. There's no reason to mess with it. Don't try to communicate with spirits because you have no idea what you're going to get. You have no idea what's going to come through. You have no control over what comes through. It doesn't matter how prepared you are. It doesn't matter what protections you put up. When you invite a spirit in, all you've done is you've opened the door and you've allowed anything to come through, regardless of what protection you put up. Because you throw away the protection the moment you give an invitation. Right, and sometimes it's not always easy to have it leave. <laughs> and it is different, though, when you're dealing with a medium, and that's their natural ability, because a good medium doesn't call on a spirit. A good medium listens to the spirit that comes to them. There's a difference. I believe that. It's just that spirit communication is a very slippery slope. And if you do something incorrectly, like if you make one mistake, you open yourself up to something horrendous. For instance, we were talking about the Devil in Connecticut case, the David Watson case a little while ago. Mm -hmm. And Arnie Johnson was involved in that case. He was a young man who was engaged to David's sister, and he was helping my grandparents, and he was watching these, I believe, 36 demons, uh, 
attack, torment, and possess the boy. Uh -huh. And he was holding the boy down and he said, come into me, take me on instead, leave him alone. You know, he was just trying to help. Uh -huh. But he gave absolute invitation for this thing to come into him. And not long afterward, he did come under possession. And he was with his landlord and his girlfriend at the time. And he ended up crouched on a rock about 50 feet away from the landlord and his girlfriend. His landlord clutched his belly, fell on the ground, and it turned out he had Arnie Johnson's knife in his belly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. Yeah, that was awful. My grandparents tried to use possession as the defense in that case, which I wasn't, um, I did not support that time, but I was only maybe 12 years old, 13, and uh, my opinion didn't count. Uh, but of course the judge would not listen to that. Unfortunately, Marty did go to jail for five years from that spot. Terrible. Hey, buddy, hey, buddy. Alright, uh, we have any questions or. Yeah, um. Like, share anything else before we go? Like, how people do. I'm sorry, would I like to share anything else? How, how the, uh, people should find you? Uh, they can. Oh, well, as I, as I said earlier, if you, if you need help. Please contact us either on Facebook at uh, the Warren Legacy Foundation for Paranormal Research or write to us at warrenlegacyfoundation at gmail.com. You can also write to me personally at chrismckinnell01 at gmail.com or you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can also find us at warrenfiles.com. Uh, I believe that one of my colleagues just put me on uh, Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. Okay. Um, I don't think I'm on Twitter, although God knows I might be. Um, I'm not very good with technology. That's something I need to others. Right, I taught myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, we're here to help. So if anybody needs help, please contact us. We want to help you. And uh, it's not just me. There are hundreds of good people involved with us that work for the foundation all around the world, mm -hmm. and we're there to help you. Yeah, I, I enjoy talking to Michelle. Yeah, Michelle Bruce is absolutely one of my very best. Um, she is the regional director for the Midwestern United States, as well as Riverside, Iowa, Paranormal, RIP. Um, mm -hmm. She can also be found on, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. Um, I always want to call it the Spirit Network, and if it's not the Spirit Network, um, I'm actually, I'll have a forum on there soon myself, and you would think I could remember the name of the name of my own uh, network. That's okay. That's so Maybe you can share it. Maybe you can share it. The Spirit Realm Network, on, uh, both on Facebook and on the internet. Okay, well, I know it's already um, toward the end of the show, and I really just thank you again for your time. That's my pleasure. And, and I hope it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And I hope we can do that and video next time. For the, we are always welcome at you and Michelle and whoever is available. Well, there, there are plenty of great people uh, that work with, with me, my partners, and I'm sure that you would get a lot more value talking to them as well. Uh, I can certainly recommend a, a number of good people uh, for you. And I'd be happy to come on anytime. Anytime I can help people, I'm happy to do it. Great, thank you. My pleasure. God bless you. Thank you. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, that was um, Chris McKinnell from uh, the Warren's Foundation, mm -hmm. also Chris the Warren's. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Are we still on? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, um, I think I hit that button. Anyway, 
I hope you guys enjoyed this, and it will be featured on the podcast um, later on today. So I'll be working on that, and uh, hopefully it recorded. So thank you guys for your questions. We'll be back next time. And I'll be live with Kristen uh, with Bernie, and then Bill with Bernie. All right, later guys. Thank you, Chris. Alright, that concludes the show. Thank you guys.